Hi, everybody. My name is Julie Williams, and this is the VoiceOver Insider Podcast. And I'm very, very excited about our guest today because I've worked with him. He's a business consultant, and uh, and I first heard him on a business podcast, and it was just incredible. And then my working with him uh, definitely measured up to what my expectations were. His name is Mike Verrett of Verrett & Associates. And basically, what he does is he helps small businesses and larger ones figure out their brand positioning, which, you know, we kind of all need to do that in the voiceover industry. And he makes sure you're not leaving any of that low hanging fruit on the table. You're not going to get away with that. And um, basically, okay, to, to put it in a nutshell, he performs miracles. <laughs> what Mike does is he'll really help you um, protect your your brand and protect yourself from some of the biggest marketing pitfalls that we can all fall into if we don't know any better. Um, and also help us to engage better with our, our custom audience, which he can help you target and show you how to target. Um, I, did, I didn't say everything. You have a lot more to say. <laughs> Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Julie, it is a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I, uh, yeah, I never say no to a mic. Oh, God forbid. <laughs> Good advice right off the start. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in your industry. So I heard you uh, talk once on a, a podcast about the elevator pitch. Now, you know, I, I think probably everybody in their mind, the elevator pitch, you actually picture yourself in an elevator talking to somebody and you literally have 30 seconds before they're going to get off the floor, you know. But the elevator pitch once you, let's say, customize it for the elevator, <laughs> um, yeah. it can be expanded or contracted or used in so many different ways. So tell us how you go about structuring an elevator pitch, because I know we have a course on it too. Yeah, the, um, the first thing to understand is it's less about brand positioning and more about what your audience hears. So every business sort of starts from the same point where they, they start with asking themselves the question, what problem do I solve for my customer? Right. And then they build that solution. And that becomes the product or service and the benefit to their audience. But all of that is happening internally. All of that is happening within the silo or the vacuum of the business. And the first thing to understand is the difference between a business and a human being is this. There's no business without show business. We consistently are playing a role. We have scripts, we have directors, we have props, we have sets, but we're never thinking the way we normally do. And to give you a very simple example of this, think about the language that we use in business. We use terms like ideate and synergize. Mm -hmm. Those aren't things that human beings say. If you and I were just old friends, I was visiting you and, uh, you know, I was down in the area and we got together for a cup of coffee and I said, I got to run, got to meet my family. So what are your KPIs this weekend? <laughs> right. Your key performance indicators. I would never, ever say that in a conversation, but businesses think that way all the time. And what's worse is they think about a hundred percent of their business in those terms. Right. And they what think an, everybody knows what it is. I heard uh, somebody on a podcast say that I've been in business 45 years. I didn't know what it was. Exactly. I find out something new every day, mm -hmm. you know, but the challenge for every business is 100 percent of what they're thinking. Only 5 percent of it matters to their audience. And they are trained to think that that 5 percent is services and benefits. If every business is selling services and benefits in whatever niche or whatever vertical, they all sound exactly the same to the audience. Right. They're all saying, if you're, a pl if you're looking for a plumber and you type in plumber in Google, the results are going to be, say the first three are, we're a plumber, here's the phone number. Doherty and Sons plumber, here's the phone number. But the next one you look at says stop. Water has escaped the system that it's supposed to be in in your house. That is extremely bad. Don't wait. Call now. One of those plumbers is speaking to you about why you need a plumber. That's right. If there's a leak in your house, it does not wait till the weekend like a light bulb or a shingle. It needs to be dealt with immediately. You're not looking for the yellow. I mean, you're going through it like the yellow pages initially, right? You're going through it almost like phone listings. But one stands out because they are saying exactly what you're thinking. 
Right. That's what different looks like in the mind of the audience. Okay. And getting there has to do with understanding how to talk to them the right way. If you're thinking as the business, you're going to express yourself as the business. You could have the greatest solution in the world, but if the expression of that is not perceived by your audience, then you're out of luck. It's like not having a solution because they can't hear you. Sometimes for us businesses, it's really easy to confuse, you know, what do you do? Oh, I do this, my services, as opposed to what matters to them about it. You know, what do they hitting, do You're it? hitting right on it. Yeah, yeah you're hitting right it, on it. There, there's a fine line, but it's not easy to do that. How do you do that? Here's the key. Every audience remembers one of three things. First, best, or different. In other words, in their mind, you need to be one of those things to be held on to, to get that connection. First and best are extremely hard to come by, right? But different, we can all do, and it's understanding what different looks like to an audience. Mm -hmm. So let's take the example of the elevator pitch. And I do this with intent to get people thinking about what they normally do when they or or would say if they're asked to give an elevator pitch. And what I point out to them is if you go to a networking event and listen to what people are saying they do, pretend that to you on an elevator saying, what do you do? And they answer with, I'm an account executive. I'm a real estate agent. I am in IT, something like that. What your brain is going to remember is Mike and IT. That's it. So no matter what I say next, you are going to strip it down for parts and remember what your brain can store away in this mess. We remember a lot, but it's by remembering a little bit of each thing. It creates recall. If the only recall I have, the first impression I have is... I'm a PR executive or I own a public relations firm. Let's say something like that. All I'm going to remember is Julie public relations firm. The other side of that is if they start with the words, I help and then go on to say everything from beginning to end in 10 seconds. I don't know where to look. I've been overwhelmed. So is it that with um, I help or is it just too much information? It needs to be broken down into a way they can consume it. You know, I mean, I'm taking you through the story. I can't read everything on one page and just say, now you get it. I have to take you through it. It's a narrative. So you, the person in the networking group, let's say, is thinking, I just have to say what I do so they have the awareness. But what you're not considering is they're not going to remember it. And the ability, next time you're in a networking group, I challenge your whole audience to do this. Count how many people either start with a literal functional job title type of approach or start with I help. And you'll start to see repetitiveness and monotony of that. If I'm in PR, public relations, and I own a public relations firm, and you say, okay, Mike, what do you do? If I tell you I make news when it matters, imagine the difference than if I said I own a PR firm. I have just sounded completely different than any other PR firm that you've encountered, I'm willing to bet. I'll have to ask you, uh, what? (laughs) I'll have to ask you more about- You need to know more. I could be a reporter. I could be an unruly celebrity in the gossip column at that point. But I need you to want to know more. And then my elevator is off and running. The first floor is creating connection. How do you connect with your audience on their terms in a way that's going to intrigue them? So if you picture somebody reading resumes for a moment, they spend an average of five to seven seconds per resume. That's it. Which means the only way they read beyond the first sentence is if it intrigues them. Mm -hmm. And it's not a business filter at that point in that first five to seven seconds. It's does this intrigue me enough to read beyond that's then they put on their business hat Mm. but that point of connection is vital in a world where people can put a word into google and get 50 results in 0.3 seconds you need to be able to stand out in that kind of world so connection is first and then after that if you hit them with your services you're no better off yeah i got your attention here's the exact same thing as everyone else you need to start telling them the story in the right order. Your message. It starts with connection, getting them to say, tell me more. From there, you want to tell them who you help, 
than what they're going through. The challenge in audience is the second floor. You want them to say, how do you help them? So you can go to the third floor. Simple solution stated in a sentence. How does that work? That's a process, and that's on the fourth floor. I explain three steps on how I work beginning to end with the client. So they see beginning to end. Now, fifth floor, they say, what do I get from that? Or what does your client get in that experience? Those are my services on the fifth floor. And they hang from each step of my process. So it looks like an experience through the process. Sixth floor, how are they better off? Benefits. Seventh floor, can you prove it? Validation, case study, social proof. Eighth floor, what do you want me to do next? Call to action. If you were to invert those floors, Julie, the questions they're asking are actually the order they need to get information, to elicit information to make a decision. What do you do? Oh, tell me more about that. How do you help them? How do you do that? What do they get? How are they better off? Do you have any people you've worked with before? Yeah, let me take your card. That might be an interesting conversation. That's how the human mind works. And we discard that for what's important to the business. In doing so, we all look the same. Different is what they respond to. So I'm any and once you have their attention, what's really different is if you bring it through on their terms and not the business terms. So that's where I live. We'll be right back on the VoiceOver Insider podcast. So I would say Julie's approach to coaching is direct and very kind. She's definitely no nonsense. But I would add that she's also never harsh or critical in a disheartening sort of way. She quickly assessed my skill level and asked what I wanted to accomplish by working with her. She starts by teaching her proven techniques, and that builds a solid foundation. Then she tailors her coaching to build on that foundation. Coaching with Julie gave me the tools I needed to move forward with confidence. And she can do the same for you. One of the things that Julie conveys right at the beginning, she's incredibly organized. I cannot tell you how many people I have worked with that they are very gifted, but they're not very organized. But organized appeals to me because I come from a medical background. Anyway, one of the things that she emphasized was her euphemism of the girl in the red coat, meaning you, your essence, your personality, your sound is unique. And that's what will sell in the marketplace as long as you stay true to that. And so that was certainly the case in working with Julie. And um, I'm hoping that if if we have a chance to do this again in six months, um, that I'll just have a whole sheaf of contracts <laughs> that I'll be able to show you and say, see, it really did work. But I do have faith and I do have confidence. So I'm hopeful. Julie's coaching has helped me in my regular acting as well as my voice acting. Her techniques helped me prepare for an audition and I got the part. I was able to quickly look at the script and figure out which words to emphasize and how to add music to my phrasing. And her training has really been a game changer for me. Hi there, I'm Glenn Moore, and I've been working in voiceover for many, many years. Hey, I just wanted to take a minute to say that if you are looking for a voiceover coach to help you gain a better skill set, maybe you're just getting started in the industry, or maybe you've been at this for a while, I highly recommend Julie Williams as a coach either way. She's a pro. She's been working in VO for many, many years as a talent and coach, and I studied with Julie a few years ago and really learned a lot from her, from the way she helps you approach the copy to marking it up in just the right places and on just the right words for the right emphasis and effect, to just being a good listener and coaching you not only through the mechanics of BO, but also the marketing and understanding the business more to help you deal with the reality of what it takes to succeed. Julie's coached to established pros to beginners, and she can help you elevate your skills or train to become ready for that first demo. I wish you the best in your VO career, and if you're looking for a professional VO coach to help you succeed, contact Julie to get started today. So there's, there's this realtor and then there's me and I do such and such. If I were a realtor, I would be the best, right? <laughs> so, or at least the different one. Because let's say for I argument's hate. sake, let's say for argument's sake, you live in a town, you're a realtor in a town and there are two other realtors. And that town is known for attracting people for the school system, 
So you could start to posit an idea about who's coming into that town. They have kids in elementary school age, something along those lines. You could start to even put yourself in the shoes of these people like they're moving from an urban environment to a suburban environment. These are all things that are really going through a house hunter's head in that market. If everyone is saying you're looking for a house, I'll help you find one. But you, the other two are saying that, but you are saying you are entering into the next phase of your life. And this is what defines it. Let's be really careful about what we're doing. Okay, so what, So we're starting by reading their mind and where they're at and then creating the elevator pitch to intrigue them. Yeah, let's, simpl- let's simplify reading minds for you a okay. little bit because that sounds, that sounds a little like hard to difficult. do, right? Mm-hmm. What we should be paying attention to, we talk about need state. People say, what is my customer's need state? And they look at that as a point in time, okay? Just like a dot on a graph with no line coming to it. And they're thinking about the line, leaving it is their solution. You need a plumber. I'm a plumber. Need state, right? What's really important to your audience and what helps you stand out is understanding the motivation to their state and how they got to it. You need a plumber because water is outside the system it's supposed to be in and that's really bad. Okay. That's what happened to get them to put plumber into Google. Right. Okay. It defines why they are where they are. All I'm thinking about in the example of the realtor is why would somebody be moving to this part of the air of the country or town or state? Mm-hmm. What would be their motivation for coming here? If I talk to them about that first, instead of, okay, let's look at these homes. It's predictive, right? But it's logical. Why would people move to this high priced town? It's because it's a good school system and in proximity to a city, let's say. Right. That's why people would move to that town. That's simple human nature and logic at that point. So what I'm going to do is say, you're in the right place to make your next big move. You're coming here. It must be for a reason. Let's make sure it counts. And that can be a challenge for a voiceover person who's thinking, how am I different than every other voiceover person? Um, but I know that, that you uh, work with people one-on-one and, and you offer a free clarity call where yes. someone might be interested in working uh, with you or, or just needs a little bit of your advice. Um, tell us about that. Well, first, let's start with the VO world where you need to lend. I, I've had the, the privilege of meeting a lot of VO artists. Uh, I worked at Hasbro Toys for some time and got to work alongside Peter Cullen, who's the voice of Optimus Prime from the franchise. Mm-hmm. And you can tell he's Optimus Prime when he talks, but he sounds exactly the same. But seeing his face and everything, it's a little bit different. It puts the humanity behind it. Yeah. But what I learned in getting to know Peter is that he sort of took me on a tour of his career and he started out on the Sonny and Cher variety show as a stage actor. He was doing Shakespeare and stuff too for a little while. Wow. But his first voice act, the first time he put his hat in the ring for voice acting was actually, he is Eeyore. Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Uh, And the fact that you can take that sound and apply it to an alien robot that turns into a truck. Yeah, right is the magic of a voiceover artist. You don't get to go in and do 50 different voices. You get to know, you get to be known for one thing, how you can connect the embodiment of a visual thing or a red of, you know, an audio thing into that voice to make it represent the purpose you need to get to. That's what you're recognized for as a VO artist. So getting in the door for a VO artist, how do you stand out as different If we're playing this out, it's how you use your voice as a tool, not I can voice that over. I've read the script and I'm perfect for this. It's the fact that a voiceover artist adds what can't be added to a flat image or to a video. If you take sound away, if you take sound away from a horror movie, it's no longer a horror movie. You ever notice that? (laughs) <laughs> That'd be a comedy movie. That's how they should make comedy movies out of out of horror movies. It's just remove the music. You remember the Benny Hill show that oh, yeah. it was hilarious. that over 
an, uh, a like a violent scene of Friday the 13th <laughs> and it becomes something different. Mm -hmm. The ability of voice actor or voiceover artist brings to the table is the ability to embody that image in a way people can understand their personality, how they think, how they talk. All of that is coming out from one sense in that. It defines what people are seeing. If I'm a voiceover artist, that's the first damn thing I want to be saying. Mm -hmm. Lending a voice to this defines the experience of that visual. And if it's the wrong voice, they get the wrong message. And the right voice can bring a character to life. So uh, basically... Not bring to life, define. Define, define is okay. even better. Yeah. You know, bring it to life is visual. Defining it is you look at a picture and you want to know something. A picture's worth a thousand words, but a lot of times we need to give them the words to work with. And, and that's what copy and voiceover are meant to do. Lead them where you want them. It's instructive all the way through. See this image? This is what it means to you. Mm -hmm. That's the power of it. Okay, and so we have to look at, depending on the kind of voiceover we do, what is it that that kind of project needs or that that, you know, creative director, e-learning developer, whatever needs for us to be doing? Yeah, you need to, as the artist, you need to understand the impact that has to be had on the audience, not on the brand. Okay, right. and where, where would we put our elevator pitches aside from like, aside from telling That's a great question. That's a great question. <clears throat> and when I work with clients, what I do is explain this. The final output of what I do, I call the audience blueprint, but you can imagine it as your sales presentation on my stationery is what it would look like functionally. Okay. But the purpose of that document is fourfold. One, you replicate it and it is your sales presentation for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. Two, it becomes the order of information on your website and exactly what you should be saying. Mm -hmm. Three, if you know that, you can mirror it on your LinkedIn profile. You're right below your picture, the two sentences, and your about me section can be mirrored from this. And four, and most important in our world, is the ability to say what you do effectively to another person. Mm -hmm. Your networking pitch is written. And you talked about the flexibility of that and networking version of it is a minute long, but I can deliver what I write in a minute. My website's longer. All that, you know, all that kind of extension of what I do is always in the same order because the audience understand if you wrote a book 20 pages long and I handed you page 12, you would know the meaning of it mm -hmm. because you wrote pages one through 11. Your audience doesn't. They need to see it in order. Mm -hmm. They don't see the context yet. Apply that to talking about your services first. There's four pages coming before services on my little elevator platform, you know? And those are the four areas that small businesses are going to make the most waves. Website, LinkedIn, what you say, and if you're asked to present it, those four things. That defines 80% of your conversations. Right. And connections. The other 20% is, is boiling it down to tactical marketing. If you know what to say and exactly what to say and exactly where the people are to say it to, then your marketing becomes a lot easier. You could go exactly to where they need to see it and just take parts of, you know, the theme of your message. If I write content on LinkedIn, it's always about first, best or different. Then they click read more about me and they get the full story. Right. Then they can go to my website and it's the same story. Mm -hmm. That's consistency. And that's what people remember. As an example, you will never see, I am sitting in a cellar of a house that was built in 1849 and I have to come down bulkhead steps and behind this door is the furnace and empty paint cans. <laughs> but all anybody sees anytime they see me is a dark top, a chair that matches my logo and almost looks like a butterfly, the door, the logo every single time. And what comes out of my mouth is consistent every single time. And that's the key to it. That's what you have to be able to do. Mm -hmm.
Uh, how does somebody get a hold of you? What is, what is your website or how do they um, do they a book a clarity call with you where they can talk about their particular situation? Absolutely. The two easiest things to do. I live on LinkedIn every day. Okay. Look up Mike Verrett, V-E-R-R-E-T on LinkedIn and connect with me there. I would love to uh, carry on the conversation. And the other thing to do is just check out my website if you want to learn more about how I operate. Uh, that lays it out a little bit more clearly and uh, in, in greater detail. Uh, but you can book a call right from there. My website is Barrett and Associates, A-N-D, Associates.com. And you have a new course on the same stuff. Is that available yet? It is launching in two, not even two weeks, 10 days, April 15th. It'll be out the door. We finalized the testing. I am proud to say that um, everybody was somewhere between 85 and 90% of the way there, which tells me I'm doing the right thing. But yeah, the course is a simple way to get to that idea of your elevator structure, what you, how you build that structure of information. And uh, it work, it's video-based and workbook-based to get to building that elevator pitch. And at the end, you click my link, you schedule time with me for 30 minutes and we go over it together. Make sure you're on track. Um, so that'll be available in 10 days time. And in the meantime, all I sell is free 30 minute phone calls to put it bluntly, but my clarity calls are meant for, if I could give people an insight on that call, I feel like I've helped and nothing off of my plate. I've met someone new and even if they hire, if they don't hire me, but I was able to give them a different way of thinking, mm -hmm. chances are they're going to tell somebody else about that. Yeah. And I think so that's, that's how I thrive. It's giving them a different way of thinking. So, uh, yeah. Um, so we've been talking with um, Mike Verrett, who is a miracle worker in marketing. That's a good title. Marketing <laughs> miracle worker. Sure. Uh, and move over. I, show you, I show you how to talk about yourself. That's right. Exactly. So um, if you would like to get a hold of Mike, it's Verrett and Associates. So that's B-E-R-R-E-T and Associates um, to get more information. And thank you yep. again for joining us on the VoiceOver Insider Podcast.